I'm going to talk about risk premiums in sovereign markets. I'm going to talk about them from a variety of uh, different perspectives. It's all going to be uh, mostly fairly low key, and I'm going to try to make my points uh, mostly through uh, pictures. I'm going to be talking about risk premiums in two ways today. One of them is going to show up in this picture, which is going to be repeated uh, throughout the talk in various forms. And so let me tell you a little bit about what is in this picture. This is the, the, the term premium in forward rates for the U.S. Treasury market. And it's simply the difference between the rate of interest you would contract on today for a loan, a one-year loan that starts in two years, the in two years for one-year loan contracted today at the forward rate, minus the expected future one-year rate uh, that comes from an economic model. I'm going to tell you a little bit about actually towards the end of the talk uh, for reasons that I hope will be clear as I move along. The green line in this slide is the actual forward rate. The red dotted line is the expected rate um, that comes from the expected one period or one year future rate that comes from a model. And the difference between the two is the risk premium or forward term premium, what investors demand in terms of compensation for bearing the risk of making a loan today at, at a known interest rate given that the world may be very different in two years from now. So the blue dotted line is then this forward term premium. The shading around it represents standard error bands or confidence bands for those of you who want to think in those terms. And there are several things about the picture that, that warrant mention at this early stage of the talk. Uh, it fluctuates over time. It's uh, got a clearly counter-cyclical pattern. The shaded areas there are the NBER recession dates for the United States. So when we're in a recession, the term premiums tend to be high. So we have counter-cyclical term premiums. The other striking feature of the picture probably, and I will spend some time talking about this, is that it does get very low at times. That is, risk premiums get very close to zero, at least as measured in this way. And in particular, there's a period around 2002 to 2005 where the risk premiums were hovering around zero. And uh, that's the period that Greenspan referred to as the conundrum where he had a circumstance of short-term interest rates going up, but long-term rates were falling, and how could that possibly be? And, and the logical answer is that risk premiums at the longer end of the yield curve must have been falling. And so what I want to spend time talking about today is how in the models that central banks use in inferring market risk premiums and setting policy, that financial institutions use for pricing securities, for, uh, uh, for doing their risk management, and that uh, academics use for their research. How do they capture this pattern in term premiums? And are they capturing these patterns adequately? And what I'm going to try to argue is that most central banks use models that are quite different than what financial institutions use, and for different reasons. I'm going to try, try to persuade you that they have some serious limitations and are probably doing a fairly poor job of the measuring the risk premiums uh, as depicted here in, in this slide. It's relevant, of course, not only for thinking about how banks are thinking about the risks they face for the kind of scenario analyses they do, for the stress tests that they're being asked to do right now. Uh, and of course, it's relevant to think about how central banks behave because uh, as, we, as they look at the markets and draw inferences about risk premia, they gauge how they should be setting monetary policy and how those policy changes are going to impact the real e economy, in part through changes in risk premiums. What we're looking for is an economic model that brings all these pieces together, that prices bonds accurately, that and, 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 a, and in a simple parsimonious way, the, the way that financial institutions would like to use it for understanding the risks they face for their scenario analyses and stress tests. We want to rule out arbitrage opportunities. We don't want to build in arbitrage opportunities into our model. So we want the pricing of long-term bonds and short-term bonds to be tied together in a sensible way. And we'd like macro, we can macro information to influence risk premiums or investors' attitudes towards risk but in a way that isn't counterfactual, in a way that recognizes that a big part of the variation in the macroeconomy 
has little to do with what's going on in the bond market. And we could say, by the way, everything symmetrically if we were studying equities. We would want to understand risk premium in the equity markets that uh, took into account factors outside the equity market itself. And, uh, and so can we do that? And, and the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, there is a simple, actually, way to do that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to develop the, the, the details of it here, but we actually can start with a model that looks a lot like what a financial institution would use for pricing. We can think of bond yields moving around with the shape of the yield curve. But where we're going to depart from those models is when we get to modeling risk premiums, we're going to explicitly allow the risk premiums and hence expected excess returns to depend on the state of the macro economy. And you, here you can put in your favorite set of variables, output growth, inflation, et cetera. Actually, this framework is tremendously adaptable and flexible, and, and this is relevant for a lot of the discussion that's going on now in policy circles in Europe. For example, a question that's on the table right now that many have been asking is, how do debt to GDP ratios affect risk premiums in bond markets, and, uh, and why are they affecting them differently in different countries? And, and, and how would you do that in the current framework that people are often working with? Well, one way to do that would be to think about somehow the short-term interest rate is determined directly by the debt-to-GDP ratios of countries. But then we would be back to this inconsistency again, where our models would imply that debt-to-GDP ratios uh, are, can be explained entirely by looking within the bond market of that country. And, uh, and, and we know that can't be true. So this framework lets you put in any macro variables and let them affect risk premia in a consistent way without requiring that these macro variables be explained by the shape of the yield curve. And when you do that, when you take a model like this, um, what you get is this green line that I've been talking about in all these slides up till now. So this is a model implied risk premium. It may not be exactly right, because the model surely is not exactly right, but it gives sensible results, uh, plausible patterns, and it reflects both that there are risks related to the shape of the yield curve and there are risks related to the macro economy, and both are important. So another way to put that is it reflects the fact that there is information in the yield curve that is not in the macro information that we typically look at, and there's information in the macro economy that's not captured by the information in the yield curve. And to understand risk premia, we need both. And, uh, and, and our models have had one or the other, uh, and rarely both. In fact, other than this framework that we've developed, I don't know anybody else who's had a model with, uh, that accommodates both at the same time. I've been working on a project with the International Monetary Fund, with the, the, uh, the research group there, as part of what they call their early warning system. And it's, it seems to me a heroic undertaking. It's something they feel they have to do as part of their mandate. Um, I come at it with, I'll tell you honestly, with a, a sense of skepticism but, but intrigue. And so here's the question that was presented to us. Is there a way? to extract from term premia a signal that something very anomalous is happening, that maybe we're about to face a crisis. Now, that's an interesting question and not an easy question, obviously. Even if it were true, by the way, it would be easy to talk yourself out of the signal being problematic, right? One can always come up with a story, so uh, one has to be careful about that. But let's step back for a minute. Um, we hear a lot now, the question is often being asked, whether or not sovereign spreads and, p and investors in markets are <coughs> in any way reasonably evaluating the risks they're facing. I mean, why are risk premiums so low at times? So one possibility is that investors just are completely missing what's going on, in which case, if you go to look at risk premia, you're not going to see what's going on because the markets are completely missing what's going on. But then another view is that, that, that if risk premiums seem, for example, anomalously low, maybe that's a consequence of regulatory and policy conditions that are inducing very low risk premium because people are taking advantage of these conditions in ways that are completely consistent with their objectives and incentives. And it's not the problem with the people, it's the problem with the economic environment and all of the incentives they face that are inducing behavior uh, that ends up being having real economic costs down the road. <coughs> 
So we turned this problem on its head. What we did was we went to, we took the data from about 30 countries and we said, let's look at how much of the risk premia we can explain using the macro information from that country. And let's look at how much of the risk premia is left over that is not explained by the macro economy, but that does show up in bond markets. Okay? And then if we look at that piece, the part that's not explained by the macro economy, is it telling us something about what's going on? Does it give us a signal that something might be anomalous? Now, we didn't look at just any risk premium. I didn't look at the forward rate that I showed you in these pictures. What we did was we built a portfolio of bonds that tracks the slope of the yield curve. So we looked at risk premia related to exposure to the slope of the yield curve. Why? Because when the central bank set monetary policy, they change the shape of the yield curve and they often change the slope. Easy monetary policy brings down short rates, steepens the yield curve. Tight monetary policy tends to flatten the yield curve by bringing up short rates and bringing down long rates. Other economic developments in the world often affect the slope of the yield curve, like the sovereign crises we're facing now. And I can show you a couple of pictures. So here's a picture that comes out of the US. It's that piece of the risk premia on exposure to the slope of the yield curve that is not explained by information about the US macro economy. And what you can see here is that it fluctuates around fairly substantially. And sure enough, at the end of 06 going on to into 07, towards the sort of middle of 07, it hit a historical low relative to the previous 20 years. So risk premia were not only low, but they were, ano they were anomalously low relative not to what, the bond, to what the macro economy in normal times would have told you, but the bond market had built them into the risk premia, and that was reflected in the information in the yield curve, and it shows up in this measure. So at that time, one might have hoped that they would have been pausing and asking, why is it that these risk premia so measured are so extremely low? And had they then taken the data on the balance sheets of financial institutions and developments in markets, in the mortgage market in particular, like I did in a couple slides ago, and to see whether or not that information could explain this anomalously low behavior, they would have found the answer is yes. Now, what's intriguing about this picture may be a little bit frightening, depending on your perspective about, what, uh, about Ben Bernanke's uh, central bank policy right now in the US, is that the risk premia shot up, of course, when the economy deteriorated and we went into the crisis. But then we've seen a massive infusion of liquidity, and things are stabilizing. Risk appetite, if you'd like, is coming back. And you can see that risk premia have fallen precipitously by this measure again and we're not too far away from where we were coming into the crisis again. So we could ask ourselves, why is that? And one answer is, well, the U.S. economy is much weaker and balance sheets are tenuous. The housing market certainly hasn't stabilized. And so this is just a reflection of pure weakness in the economy. We understand that. But others might take the view that the Federal Reserve has been excessive in its liberal monetary policy, it's quantitative easing. We're anticipating further quantitative easing, uh, and, and money managers are now in the press saying today and yesterday that we expect more easing going forward. And uh, the markets are building that in, and, uh, and people are investing accordingly, and, uh, and maybe we should be cautious. So